I'm very pleased to welcome back to the show. You could probably tell that because I flew to Tampa Bay, Florida to get the chance to talk to who I've called the world's top economic and financial forecaster, Martin Armstrong, Armstrong Economics. Marty, what a pleasure to be here with you. Well, I'm glad you came down. Well, 1983, I remember going into a hotel room in the Hyatt Regency in Vancouver. You had a very old, you know, probably today's standards, of course, but this big square box computer on the desk. And you said, I want to show you something. And what Marty proceeded to show me was the first time I'd ever heard voice recognition. So Marty just asked the computer, can you show me the trading for gold in the last seven days? The computer then puts up the different va the values and the, and the chart. Then Marty says, can you show me that pattern going back 100 years, but a 90% uh, uh, cooperation, the same thing for 90%. Does it mirror it? This whole list comes up. Marty says, that's too many. Give me 95% correlation. Give me 98%. And here comes these few th things. He said, computer, tell me what price the probability is coming into next week. That was the beginning I'd ever seen of model-based investment planning, uh, let alone the cyclical analysis. But that analysis, as I said many times, uh, is only as good as its predictive level. Well, the Armstrong economic model is uh, the most accurate predictive model I've seen. So let me get to you, Marty, with this. Just quickly, what's the biggest financial problem or deal facing us today? What keeps you up at night worried about the rest of us? It's basically the pension funds, and people don't quite appreciate, but it's mostly the pension funds in the government sector. I mean, that's as they start to go down, um, and this is a consequence that every time a government does one thing to solve one so problem, it creates the, the problem for that the future solution will need. So we lowered interest rates uh, to stimulate the economy, but then what happened? Then all the pension funds are going bust. Mm -hmm. So it's the pension funds largely, not necessarily the private sector, uh, but it's the government sector. And largely because they haven't funded them. And they just look at us as absolute herds of cattle or sheep. And they've never had to bother with funding this stuff because they assumed we're always going to have enough, an endless supply of people to tax, mm -hmm. and, and that will be the future payment. So the problem comes in when birth rates start going down and all this, you know, and, you know, it's it's setting the stage. We see California, you know, we it's everywhere. Every country, Germany, half the municipalities are basically insolvent. Uh, you have uh, in the U.S., Indiana is complete. People are just leaving. This is what the fall of Rome was about. People don't understand if, and why I make a distinction between um, movable and non-movable assets. The, the non-movable, which is real estate, if they keep raising taxes and taxes and taxes and you can't afford it, what happens? You just pick up and leave. And Rome, at the peak of the economy, had a population of 1 million. At the bottom, it fell to 15,000. Mm -hmm. So obviously people just walked away. And we're seeing that in Detroit. I mean, that was yes. one of the other things. Their industrial base left, the people left, but the pension stayed. Uh, and you're, you're seeing houses that used to be very nice in the 1920s that are just empty and vacant today. But that's what's so interesting about this. A lot of people, a lot, virtually everyone, doesn't make the connection. And that's a great example of what I love to do in Money Talks. So here's the pension problem. People say, yeah, but it's not my pension. Well, actually, it's going to be your house, maybe. You know, actually, it'll be your interest rates, maybe. It might be your stocks, maybe. You know, there's a direct relation that comes right into our livelihoods. Well, California, you know, they were looking at raising taxes to, to bail out CalPERS yes. because it didn't make enough money for state government employees. But then there's, there is another aspect to this. I mean, as you know, I, I work a lot with governments behind the curtain. And you have California, New York, and a number of states now joining lobbying Washington to basically take all private pension funds and dump them in their control and they say then that will solve our problem. And haven't we seen that in Poland when they confiscated? Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm saying it's not unprecedented. We're seeing oh this no, kind of they've stuff. done the same thing in Argentina. Yeah. I mean it's... Uh, Let me ask you, impact of the pension crisis, and I know I'm you know, oversimplifying, but the impact of the pension crisis, so we look at potential impact on a municipal municipality, so you got impact on people moving out, which real estate. I mean, who wants to move back into Chicago right now when they've just raised property taxes 33%? Nobody. I, yeah. that, that's the whole problem. I mean, there's net, the, the um, 
Census Bureau has shown that you know Indiana basically uh, and Illinois in particular you're, you're seeing net migration out so they're losing population okay what about impact on interest rates well you know that infects basically across the board as well and and there we have major problems um, you know, and I mean, I deal internationally. I just got back from the Middle East and I've been in Europe three weeks before that. Virtually a, a good stiff wind will blow the European banking system down. Yeah. Why? Because they never effectively created a national debt. So to be politically correct, every bank had to have a piece of everybody's debt within the Eurozone. So now Greece starts to go down, they take haircuts, you're, you're basically reducing the reserves of the bank. So then you move to negative interest rates. And in the States, you know, people don't understand what's been going on, but all our major banking clients in Europe, they simply picked up their cash and you have a choice. Gee, if I park it at the ECB, I give them a half a percent. No, let me see. I'll ship it to our U.S. branch. They'll park it at the Fed, and I'll earn a half a percent. Mm -hmm. So you have excess reserves at $3 trillion. But a great example of how governments institute policies without understanding the consequences, which I, uh, you knew better than anyone I know knows all of the historical precedent, but think about that one. It's straightforward to understand for people. I mean, economies survive when more people, more money comes in. You know, that's how things work. And here they have instituted a policy that encourages massive amounts of money to leave Europe at a time it's in deflation and a time when there's no growth. Yeah. You know, but it's their policy that did it. Well, it, governments, basically, if you're going to, you know, their idea is we're going to stimulate. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you stimulate? Well, we're going to buy the bonds back from the banks. And hopefully the banks will lend money. Hopefully, yeah. okay, but they don't, and then and then and they didn't. And no, and, and everybody, you had all these crazy people, analysts pretending, oh, this is going to be hyperinflation, etc. It depends upon where the money goes. All right. Yes, the Fed bought in four trillion dollars. Oh, wow, that's going to be hyperinflation. No, it won't. One is all these theories are antiquated. They're based upon the fixed exchange rate system yeah. from Bretton Woods, and. I'm the one that started writing questions for the House Banking Committee because these people don't understand. Mm -hmm. China said, oh, you're going to buy 30-year bonds? Thank you very much. They sold. These theories assume it's just a domestic economy, that there isn't anybody on the outside. So if I buy in the bonds, oh, that will put more money in the system and that will ease it. That... That assumes an American owns the bonds you're buying. And it's just not that way. i got to take a break. I'm coming back. I'm going to talk uh, Martin Armstrong's model, clearly spelled out, the beginning of a sovereign debt crisis uh, in Europe in 2009-10. We saw that with Greece. Uh, said it was escalating in the uh, October 2015. I want to get the implications. I want to talk about government bonds because I know Marty's very concerned on your behalf on government bonds volatility, currencies, all of that coming your way. And don't worry, we got more. we got a shocking stat for you. We're going to continue this part of the conversation. All of that coming your way. You're listening to Money Talks on the Chorus Radio Network and the Money Talks Network. Phil Collins' top hit, Another Day in Paradise. It's also the year that Martin Armstrong's economic confidence model predicted the top in the Nikkei index. In fact, Marty phoned me that day, December 29th, 2000, or the 1989, and said, Mike, just so you know, 39,000 is the top. It's going to 8,000, and it ain't coming back in your lifetime. Now, I didn't know at the time if he was just predicting I wasn't going to live very long, but here we are uh, 20 years later. And obviously, that prediction was correct. Marty joins me live here at Tampa Bay, Florida. Marty, I just want to get an update. The other thing that, of course, you've been chronicling and uh, predicting 
uh, has been the sovereign debt crisis. You started with the prediction at the World Outlook Conference. You did it for us, saying uh, this was 1998, and you're telling us in 2009, 2010, Greek bonds will go bust <laughs> that far in advance, and that would begin a European crisis. Uh, you've told our audience at the World Outlook that the sovereign debt crisis would get another leg. The next leg of it would become apparent uh, in October 1st, uh, 2015. I wanted to get a quick update, and we'll get the implications in one moment of where you see that heading right now, the sovereign debt crisis. Well, it's, it's you know you have to understand this is an economic collapse, not a market co collapse. Mm -hmm. So it's like one domino pushing over into the next, into the next, into the next. And uh, the two things you have to understand is where does the sovereign debt crisis begin? First, it begins always on the peripheral, never in the core. Mm -hmm. So that meant Greece, the external ones, exactly. start to go down. Things, and it, yeah. then it spreads in, all right? Secondly, within a, particularly a domestic uh, economy, where is it going to begin? It begins at the municipal level and, this, and the state and province level. Why? Because they can't print the money. Mm -hmm. The feds can all right. So all they can do is raise taxes more and more and more. All right. So they still no government that I have dealt with and I, I look at globally has figured out yet. Gee, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. It's they're only interested in. Well, what do I got to do next? I got to pay this bill next week. Mm -hmm. All right. So, well, we'll just raise taxes. OK, nobody's stepping back and saying, Okay, we keep doing this. Where are we going? I mean, every revolution throughout history has begun with taxation. Once you pass a level where people can no longer survive, um, we're all happy to ignore government and politics. If they leave me alone, I leave them alone. Okay, you're taking a piece of the action. All right, we understand that. When you start impacting the way people can live, um, now you're in the serious problems. And, you know, all this stuff about socialism and everything, it sounds great, wonderful, but what's actually happened over the course of the years? I mean, about 70% of the national debts on average globally have been accumulative interest. So it didn't go help roads and schools and, and mm -hmm. all this stuff. It's, it's just basically regurgitating the debt that keeps going. And then you look at the standard of living has been declining dramatically. This is really what they don't understand. This is why Trump was elected. You had people coming out saying, I can't take this anymore. All right. Years ago, all right, a, a family could get by with just the, the, you know, the husband working. All right. Then you put in the payroll tax. Oh, we need this for World War II. Uh, we'll, we'll rescind it afterwards. And, of course, any tax they put in never disappears. It only gets worse. So today, you know, you talk about women's rights, et cetera, equal pay. Women have lost the right to stay home and raise the kids. It takes for any, you know, family that's starting, young family, it takes two salaries just to get by. So where is this improving the standard of living? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's you keep raising these taxes and taxes and taxes, and it's just you know, and it, it's being squandered and wasted on government. You know, you've got you know your your guy taking you know your head of state taking a vacation five hundred thousand dollars a cost for his for his vacation. Hillary Clinton goes and rents a house for a vacation one hundred and fifty thousand for a month. Mm -hmm. Who lives this way? Yeah. Let me ask you, okay, so the implications, and, and a fascinating point that I hope everyone really focused on was we're starting to see the ripple because it starts on, you know, countries you might say, well, that's not important to me or that's right. not important. Maybe a city like Stockton, California, bankrupt. You know, uh, we're seeing it in others. Uh, two, uh, two counties in California recently, Atlantic City, Puerto Rico, before the hurricane. You know, the list starts getting longer. What For an individual, that warning sign is, fu uh, is flashing. Does that say, don't buy stocks, don't buy bonds, don't buy this, don't buy that? Stay away from all municipal bonds. Mm -hmm. Even if you have one, well, this city's okay, my mind's doing all right, they will all be painted with the same brush. Yeah. Once they start going down, 
you know, the way capital acts, like that Herbert Hoover quote that you yeah. just you saying. just you just spoke about. You know, take a look, read. You know what he wrote there in his memoirs, 1931. You can get it off the internet, mm -hmm. read it, and just replace the names. Mm -hmm. To Greece, 2010. Yeah. All right. What did he say? He basically said, you know, once <clears throat> capital started moving, they didn't know where it was going. Yeah. It was going so fast. All right. Once the trade in Greece went, what did the traders do? Oh, gee, we made a lot of money on that. Who's next? Oh, Portugal. Yes. Oh, look at Spain, Italy. Oh, France. They're the same. And it, that's a contagion. Is. Uh, oh, this is a bit silly because it's well. First of all, so the message is, uh, you meant municipal. What about at the state, provincial level? It, they, the municipal starts to go first. You got fifty percent of the municipals in Germany basically um, in in insolvency. Right. And she was waiting for the election, and after the election, they want to put a tax in now to try and bail out bail out municipals. <laughs> okay, so um, it's always raise more taxes, and you know it. it the bottom line is what do people really have at the end of the day and that's what's starting to rise up and it, it that was Brit exit you were seeing it in Barcelona we're seeing everywhere mm -hmm. across the globe you know and so uh, you want to stay away from the municipals it will then spread as a contagion to to the state and provincial level who also can't print money Mm -hmm. All right, and then it it manifests in the, for example, you'll we'll see the euro break up, um, and as the economic conditions are different, in in all these things, and and Greece is is much more different, you know, economy than than uh, than Germany. Yeah, we got to take a break. Martin Armstrong is here. Go to armstrongeconomics.com. ArmstrongEconomics.com. Uh, Marty writes, and he does it because he wants to help the public. A daily blog. It's actually prolific. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you more about that when we come back. I got a shocking stat for you, courtesy of Martin Armstrong. We'll talk more about the currencies and volatility. All of that on Money Talks. We're featuring the music of the economic confidence model. That is Shania Twain. The year was 2000. Oh, sorry, the year was 1999 for that one. That don't impress me much. That's also the year that the Armstrong economic computer model correctly predicted the date of the low in oil and gold. Time now for this week's shocking stat of the week, and I'm going to get right to it. We've been talking about the implications of unfunded pensions for years. Marty produced a great report about two years ago on it, and as he mentioned, it's not just retirees who will pay the price. It's going to be taxpayers, which brings me to this week's shocking stat of the week. Teachers in Kentucky are demanding each Kentucky household pay $3,200 each for the next two years. Why? In order to top up the teacher's pension plan. That works out to $5.4 billion over just two years to top up Kentucky's 365,000 teachers and other public uh, employees' unfunded pension schemes. Welcome to the future. Marty, as I say, you did a special report on pensions. and just, just a, We talked a little, little bit earlier, but just a couple of quick notes on it. The Actually, one of the we we have been advising a number of pension funds that are coming to us now. Uh, one of them, a uh, major Canadian one, mm -hmm. I will say, um, did what we said. They got rid of government bonds and they started moving to the private sector. S and P went in and to, to give them a rating, and they said, "Oh, gee, you're taking on more risk." And they said, "No, we actually looked at what Armstrong said. We ran our own studies, and he's right." Corporate debt, you know, double A, triple A, they don't, you know, basically go belly up. Governments always default. Mm -hmm. S&P didn't know what to say. They just walked out and left them alone. 
Well, I, I'm, to be honest, I'm happy to hear that there's that concern because I'm wondering, pensions are a little different issue because it's actuarial accounting meets demographics meets, you know, very easily predictable payouts. And then you look and say, uh-uh, not enough. And I'm surprised that we haven't seen more action and more concern uh, when it comes because, as I say, I'm not a public sector worker. I'm not going to get a pension from them. I'm, my Canada pension's fine. I'm not going to get a, uh, you know, a public sector pension. But I'm a taxpayer, and I'm going to be funding any shortfall. So it, yeah, this concerned. is the whole problem is that, like I said, they just look at us as an endless supply of revenue for them. And it's very, very bad. But this is the political outlook globally. Let me just switch a tiny bit. It's, it's all related, and that is uh, I'm going back into the early 80s, and it's the first time I'd ever seen volatility modeling, which you did for, you know, uh, mm -hmm. through your computer. But people don't know. Martin has obviously an economic background, but he has a computer background. He started at RCA when computers filled the whole room, you know, like you saw uh, uh, imitation game, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but starting there, which I think was a phenomenal benefit to learn the language, to learn the coding, to learn everything. And of course, that's produced your Socrates model, produced uh, you know the, the, the things I'm talking about with modeling, in which, as I say, uh, you instructed me on saying the importance of doing it this way. But when you look at, at the volatility now, I mean, things change so fast. Where are we at? Are we, is more coming, less coming? Are we finally going to slow down? No, it's going to, this is the calm before the storm. Mm -hmm. Um, what you have to understand is they've gone after banks for, you know, trading, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, retail participation is still at about 50% of what it was in 07. Now you've gone after the banks, um, and they've been paying a lot of big fines, etc. So a lot of the banks are now uh, getting out of proprietary trading. And so consequently, the liquidity of markets is, is down dramatically. Now you take Europe, it's so socialistic, you wouldn't believe it, but they don't understand markets at all, so they made it illegal to short any government bonds. So basically they've destroyed the free market in Europe completely. So what do you get out of this? And, and that is, as soon as anything happens that scares capital, mm -hmm. um, retail and, and, and institutional, you suddenly get no bid. That's what creates the flash crash. Um, when I was called into the Brady Commission to investigate the 87 crash, they don't understand this stuff. And the first word, oh, we're going to find this short player that pushed this down. And I said to him, excuse me, do you realize that every investigation since 1907 began with those words and you never found this big mythical short yet? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's that everybody's long. They try to sell. And guess what? There's no bid. All right. That's the volatility that concerns me. Whatever we saw between 07 to 09 is going to be magnified for the next one. That sounds like a uh, that sounds like a great promotion for Money Talks. How are you going to survive? You're going to listen to Money Talks here, <laughs> Martin Armstrong. You can find it at ArmstrongEconomics.com. He writes a daily vlog on a variety of subjects. So the international perspective is is really key. Uh, I want to come back to one thing, and you only have a minute because you've been writing about it. Catalonia, part of that big picture breakup of the EU. Yeah, it's it's this is very very profound because all you have to do is look at what the government is doing. Canada, you had two referendums for Quebec, Quebec yeah. okay? Britain, they allowed a referendum for Scotland, okay? Here, they're saying, the EU is saying, you don't even have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've sent in troops, and, and now they've, they've, they've gone after Google to shut down any use of Google to communicate. And now, and just yesterday, they closed the airspace to stop planes going into Barcelona because, oh, people are gathering there to protest against the government. Well, how do you think this is going to function? A basic human right is the right to revolt against the government when it's gone too far. American Revolution, French Revolution, English Civil War. I mean, this is part of humanity. We're not drones here are cattle to be herded and so shut up you do what we, we tell you that's slavery mm -hmm. 
talking with Martin Armstrong. I'm going to take a break. I promise I'm just going to get his quick fix on gold. I'm going to talk about the loony with him. And a very he's going to give one very positive prediction. So we're talking government. And that's the thing. I always make a distinction. Government's in challenge right now, but there's something else that isn't that is in your benefit. We'll talk, chat about that when we come back. Plus, my famous rapid round. The lightning round's coming with Martin Armstrong on the Money Talks Network. But that will keep me warm in the middle of the night That don't impress me much uh-huh, yeah, yeah. If you had one shot or one opportunity To seize everything you ever wanted One moment Would you capture it? Yo. Financial show featuring Eminem. The year is 2000. Lose Yourself is the song. That year in March was the peak of the NASDAQ index. And as you know, it took whatever it was, 16 years to get back there. The Armstrong Economic Confidence Model predicted the date of the crash of the dot-com bubble. Marty Armstrong is with me here live at Tampa Bay at the Armstrong Studios, I call them. Uh, Marty, I just want to, because time's now kind of short, I just want to fire a couple of things at you and mm-hmm. get a comment. Uh, your, uh, Marty has a, which is fantastic because you have access to it, it's called Socrates. It is the model that he uses, 33,000 variables plus to arrive at the predictions I've been chatting about and the, uh, the change in directions. The individual, can, excuse me, you can go to individual stocks. In this case, I want to talk to him about gold. Why? Because the model gave a number, I think it was 1362.50 uh, in this latest run. Yes. And said very specifically, that's your turn down on gold. That's exactly what happened. It stopped at 40. Yeah. Well, 10 cents below it. And uh, so I want to just uh, get a quick uh, take on gold at this point. You have to understand that the the bulk of the people, all right, do not look at this as a collapsing government yet. Mm-hmm. We're we're getting there, but it, it's going to take some more. Plus, you have changes in the uh, generational evolution. Uh, in India, despite everything you're saying, the young younger generation are not buying gold like the older generation. The same thing here. You go to Starbucks or something and look at you know the youth. What are they doing? They hold up their phone. They don't even have paper money. Yeah. All right. So things do change. All right. So just because the older generation, oh, you go buy gold, that's the hedge against everything. It's not taking off. Why? Because there are other. You're not the only ones out there. Mm-hmm. You know there are other segments, and eventually they will come up about but you have to look at when the confidence in government collapses we're talking about things and you know there are people that are smart and so you know germany was going in the wrong direction they hopped on a boat and they and they fled mm-hmm. the others kept saying you know oh well maybe it'll work out i mean you can't ignore I, it I had a professor who basically explained it this way. Two people were on top of the World Trade Center when it used to be there, uh, and a good stiff wind blows them over. The pessimist immediately started praying, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Forgive me for all my sins. The optimist, as he's passing the fourth floor, said, well, so far, so good. Okay, let me switch to the Canadian dollar. Same thing. I use Socrates for that. People asked me where I thought it was going. I said 83 cents. It bumps right there. Can't close there. I know that, but it bumps there. And now we slid back. What does uh, your model tell Sports us for the short Sports at 78 term? and 20, you know, and a quarter, and you get a weekly closing below that, and it confirms we're heading back down again. What you have to understand is what breaks the system, mm-hmm. and um, what breaks it is only when the U.S. dollar goes up. All right, that's. You know, when Roosevelt confiscated gold and devalued the dollar, why? Because the dollar went up so high. You had protectionism. The U.S. felt they couldn't sell anything. When did that happen again? 1985. Pound went to par. What happened? They started G5. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the dollar goes down, as you have all these people like, oh, the dollar is going to crash, whatever. Trump's fantastic. That's what he wants, lower dollar. The world, everybody's fat and happy because they borrow in dollars. They have to pay back less. 
Okay, what's going to break this system? A rising dollar, not a lower dollar. Mm -hmm. It's and what causes that? Look, it has been war, World War One, World War Two. All the money went to the to the states. All right, but also what's causing it is the collapse in, in governments that we're seeing, like in the EU, um, and we're seeing problems in Japan. So you know now you have a set of bookends over there with Rocket Man. Mm -hmm. You got North Korea and you have Iran saying, "Oh, gee, that's a good idea. We're going to start a missile defense system right. now." Uh, let me come very quickly. Uh, long-term stock market. Long-term stock market. Look, this is. It is basically what we call this public versus private. At times, all right, you go back to the 20s, yes, the private sector got excessive. That is what crashed. And what do you do? You run to bonds. Okay. What do you do when government is the problem? Mm -hmm. You run to the private sector. This is why, you know, you've, you've had, I mean, we came out and said, look, the Dow was going to make new highs, you know, back in, in 20, you know, in, in 2010. Barron's wrote an article said, "Oh, Armstrong says that Dow's going to make new highs." Ha ha ha! Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 2011. Yeah. All right, because they had never covered anything since because they were wrong. Yeah. All right, and you've had nothing but basically seven years of analysts saying the stock market's going to crash any day now. Um, mm -hmm. I was asked to be on one show. I said, "Why do you want me on the show?" He says, "Well, basically, you're the guy that that has been bullish." Yeah. Um, he says it's it's just overwhelming. All the people on our show just bear, bearish, bearish. So it's it's this capital movement. And if you just look at, you can go onto our site and look. We have a chart you can call up there. Just search uh, S and P. You know the the um, PE ratio. Mm -hmm. You know people were saying, oh, you know, 25 is is too high. Okay, fine. The peak on the dot com bubble was 50. Where is the historical high? 2009 at the low, reached 120. Why? If you don't trust the banks, you don't trust government, it gets to a point, I just want to put my money someplace so I get it back. It's not a question yeah. of what's my return. Okay, so PE ratios don't mean anything then. The peak of 120 is at the low in 2009. So long term, you're still. You, I know you're positive. I know that. But it's yeah. look. The, the Dow's going to go up um, to a number we don't understand right now. Yeah, your first resistance going into year end is around you know just under around twenty three thousand seven. Mm -hmm. um, then we have some around twenty five, twenty six. But this thing's going to like forty. Mm -hmm. um, it's going up much, much higher. I'm talking with Martin Armstrong. I've got time for rapid-fire questions when we come back, plus a Goofy Award, so stay with us. He's so stagnant, he knows when he goes back to this mobile home, that's when it's back to the lab again, yo. This old rap shit, he better go capture this moment and hope it don't be ready. Taylor Swift, 2014, people at the 2013 Outlook remember Marty saying specifically, hey, guess what? After the Olympics next year, Ukraine's getting invaded. It happened. We're going to finish off with a little fun with Martin Armstrong. I call it the lightning round, 10 questions with Marty. Are you ready, Marty? <laughs> uh, go ahead. Okay. I never had to do one of these. First big investment win. Uh, I would have to say queuing uh, in rare coins and silver back in the 60s. Favorite long-haul airline. You fly a lot. Oh, Lufthansa. Most fun book you've read, you read a ton, your house is full of them, but most fun you've re had reading in the last year or two? Uh, not the last year, but the, I would say the Da Vinci Code. Everything else has been more or less history, not, yeah. not fun. Favorite historical leader? Uh, Maggie Thatcher. Prediction that generated the most hate mail? Oh, unquestionably gold peaking in 2011. <laughs> Most regularly repeated policy mistake that you see through history? It's always raising taxes. Best piece of financial advice maybe you ever gave or got? Uh, go with the flow, with the cycles. Don't fight them. If 
Financial worry that keeps you up at night? I think we got this one. It's definitely the pension crisis. That's the first domino that pushes everything else over. Now, the most interesting market in 2018. It's going to be the rising dollar and stock market. And favorite financial show on radio? All right. Uh, I would say there is this crazy gray, gray-haired guy. I think he's Canadian from Vancouver. I can't recall his name, but I think it's Mike something. There you go. Right answer. You got it. I knew you'd get it right. Marty, thank you for having me in your home, and thank you for finding time, as, al- as you always do, for us oh, here. Thank it, you it for inviting so me. It's so much appreciated.